Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my AM reading video for Friday, May 5th, 2022. Going up on a Saturday, getting back into that old routine. <laughs> it has been a crazy week for me. Uh, I talked in my last video, my cat had a little bit of a health crisis flare-up that we've been dealing with for the past several weeks. Hopefully we're once again back on... Uh, the uh, optimistic side of things, but now I'm dealing with um, the beginnings of a cold as well, so kind of taking it easy. Hopefully this uh, weekend really feel like I need to recharge. Uh, so also my battery's <laughs> kind of low, so maybe I won't ramble on as much as usual in these videos if I can get to the point now. <laughs> As always with my AM reading video since last May now, May 2021, I'm starting with the next uh, short story in this collection. Uh, this is the complete collection of Dorothy Parker short stories, and I read one per AM reading video. I'm hoping to get through the whole collection maybe by the end of this year. We'll see. Uh, the one I read for this week is called The Road Home, which was published in 1933. It is a dashed off, or slightly more than her usual dashed off short story, uh, looking at the life of a couple as uh, they're leaving a party and uh, it just starts out with the most passive-aggressive behavior from the woman that you can get where she, you know, starts by picking at a song that's on the radio and then we get into, like, you know, he's saying, what do you mean? What, you didn't enjoy the night out? And she's like, oh, it was uh, really great to be, you know, left alone, ignored in the corner all night and uh, goes into this whole thing about how he was drinking and singing with his friends and uh, she didn't join in and he's like, you could have just come in and she's like, I oh, yeah, had it to be asked and they just, you know, ratchet up the drama on this stuff until they finally slap each other. And then that's kind of what, you know, makes them all, you know, lovey-dovey again. Oh, I'm sorry, I've never done anything like that. And then they go and they uh, mock the girl who apparently was uh, hanging all over him all night and mocking her singing skills as they're singing along to the radio. So, uh, there we go. It's like relatively normal for a Dorothy Parker short story and a couple's behavior that she critiques. Uh, and right now it's... I don't know, this is kind of crazy. It's kind of reminding me of, you know, the Johnny Depp Amber Heard <laughs> defamation trial going on right now, <laughs> uh, which I can't seem to get away from. Not that I'm actually watching it that closely, but, you know, I see all these crazy little clips pop, pop up on, on YouTube or, you know, in news feeds, and it just seems like a horrible mess, and I just can't help but thinking, but in a way, they're kind of the similar to this sort of uh, gestalt about... Uh, overly dramatic and, uh, you know, when there's, and possibly uh, physical uh, violence on uh, both ends, it seems like I, I, a bit of a mess that I shouldn't even be talking about, I don't actually want to talk about, except it just, you know, is one of those things that just seems so depressingly uh, awful, as in, like, you know, why do humans have to treat each other this way, and it feels like, uh, in a way, this uh, she's mocking it more. Dorothy Parker, you know, isn't as <laughs> distressed by it, but she's kind of picking up on uh, the ridiculousness of uh, some of our behaviors, I guess. So, also, since this is the first AM reading video I'm making for a new month, I will point out my uh, monthly literary newsletter, which is now live, uh, my April newsletter, I'll link below. Uh, it has uh, snippets from the Goodreads reviews of all the books I've read that month. I have uh, bookish news that caught my fancy, book pick, uh, a book quote, all that uh, sort of good stuff. Uh, and usually I try to move on into the new month and uh, leave uh, the old month behind me, but, you know, I'm making this video early uh, this month, like not waiting a week, on purpose, because uh, I'm going to try to shame myself later about the BookTube prize. But anyway, uh, since I don't have as much to report, I will talk about the final book on that newsletter, which is uh, the final book in the Expanse series, Leviathan Falls by James S.A. Corey, which I finished on audio early last week. So I guess I'll give some overall uh, feelings about highly spoilery activity, since this is book nine of nine. But the final trilogy, the one that uh, won't apparently be adapted for TV, at least not so far, it really took a dive into epic fantasy. In fact, that's the authors say it themselves, that that was sort of the genre they were trying to dip into on purpose for the final three books. And it has to do in large part with... Uh, the formation of humans' relationship with the alien species that they slowly got introduced to back in book one. And it's sort of just uh, been a 
slowish timeline uh, in terms of things. I mean, the final trilogy does take place 30 years after the six books that precede it. Uh, and it goes into epic fantasy territory, I think, because there's just no way to get around it. The type of aliens that uh, Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank created are just so supernatural. And uh, their aims and, you know, interacting with their the technology that they bring and that humans start also, you know, messing with as well. It's just, well, way too beyond, uh, you know... Uh, the hard science that actually is a major staple, especially of the first six books. Uh, so we get into, uh, you know, the whole idea of the Laconian Empire, which uh, does have that evil dictatorial empire feel to it. And uh, the High Consul, our main overarching villain of the final three books, he is taking treatments of protomolecule and it really is turning him less human and more in tune with uh, alien uh, sentiments and mindset. Uh, and everyone else is kind of just trying to hang on, I think. After all these years of prodding uh, these uh, supernatural aliens, uh, they're getting pretty sick of us and really starting to mess with uh, science, trying to just, you know, squash us already. <laughs> so we're dealing with uh, what really is an end-of-world scenario or end-of-species uh, scenario. Uh, and that's a major part of uh, the series, but also they do stay with the socio-political stuff in terms of uh, the uh, humans under the boot of the Laconian Empire trying to, you know, fight back. But uh, again, I guess the whole idea of a resistance and the evil empire, that definitely goes more into fantastical territory. I mean, obviously there's precedent in real uh, history as well, but... Uh, it definitely, you know, we're already leaning fantasy here. Uh, the stakes are, you know, beyond our, you know, realist understanding. And I feel like in a way I, I really did uh, in this final trilogy uh, miss the really stringent real politic of the first six books, which are much more grounded, I think, in a reality of uh, how our politics are going right now. I mean, and uh, how that might transmute into human actions in the future. Uh, and, and this is a, a series that uh, before the, you know, not, disregarding the alien, uh, you know, interception uh, really is all about hard science and about uh, real politics and, uh, you know, and also about uh, real socioeconomic issues and, and following people who have been oppressed and following the leaders who are, you know, trying to sort of either... Uh, keep the status quo or keep cold wars from, you know, erupting or that sort of thing, which I guess to me feels much more grounded in realism. Uh, but uh, yeah, we had to get away from that if we actually wanted to wrap up, you know, the alien uh, stuff in the final trilogy. Uh, and I feel like they did okay with the characters. I think the, the authors really deliberately tried to give them uh, the main characters who we've been with um, ever since the beginning sort of our overarching arcs about where they end up versus where they began like Naomi is the leader of uh, the underground resistance when in the very in the beginning or for the first several books really she was really trying to hide from the world uh, again I talk about this a lot but I feel like uh, her arc in the TV adaptation is just so much more dynamic that I find it very disappointing <laughs> in uh, the series. I mean, otherwise, there's a lot of amazing uh, female characters, and she's good too, but I mean, it's just in comparison. Or then we have, you know, the main character, Holden, who, I don't know, for some reason, uh, they uh, named his chapters by his first name, Jim, in this one, I don't know. Uh, he always wanted to do the best thing, the right thing, like that moral upstanding sort of uh, Don Quixote tilting at windmills and pro-democracy, sort of like disseminating all information uh, to everybody, uh, and uh, he often learns uh, throughout the course of the books how that can have uh, unintended consequences. Uh, and um, he's been so involved with the protomolecule that uh, it seems like he's inching more into, you know, having specialized information and maybe having to make more unilateral decisions, and I'm getting into spoilery territory. <laughs> Uh, or there's uh, Alex, uh, who uh, I think in a way, like, he uh, he goes on this sort of loop throughout the series about, you know, wanting to, you know, experience his wanderlust of exploring the universe versus wanting to have a family and the back and forth of it and uh, where that leads at the end of the series. And then finally there's uh, Amos, who I feel like I probably disagree with the authors with the most on uh, him. Uh, I'll, link, I'll link to a very spoilery interview they gave for the end of Leviathan Falls where they talk about how 
He's the only character who isn't capable of change because of some uh, traumatic backstory. He's sort of stuck in a way of being that uh, he really never, you know, nothing ever touches him really. You know, he's always just sort of stoic and uh, determined and on this one path. And I feel like he's kind of their version of uh, the most righteous type of person who is both unsentimental but also just unwavering in the right thing, which I feel like it's a little too simplistic for me, but I mean, that's usually I'm, you know, I feel like they are the opposite and really talk about complexities, but I feel like, I don't know, I guess I have issues with uh, the Amos character, although I like him better than the muscle in most sci-fi uh, spacefaring groups, so what do you know? <laughs> uh, so yeah, and I mean, given sort of the maximist sort of storytelling they were trying to do, I think, with uh, this final trilogy. I feel like there was just no way they would let humans off the hook by saying, you know, at the end of uh, Leviathan Falls, it's just going to be another day. We're just going to make small incremental steps as a, as, a, as a species from here on in. No, it's too huge, uh, basically, the Pandora's box that uh, was unleashed uh, with uh, what happened with, uh, well, this whole series and the proto-molecule. It's just too big for us. So we had to have, like, you know, a huge epic ending and also an epilogue, which I won't spoil except to say that really the hard science goes out the window with the epilogue. <laughs> we are well past Star Trek beam me up Scotty with that epilogue. But, uh, you know, they, uh, I guess they make it work. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty satisfied, I think, with, you know, if that's the type of story that they needed to tell with the uh, aliens and humans, they did have enough, you know, characterization for our main characters we've been with and even, you know, new characters even. They're not just, you know, cardboard cutouts. Uh, you know, I could quibble a little bit, but overall I feel like, you know, they actually felt like human beings in, you know, this epic uh, story about, you know, the survival of the species with our first alien contact. And basically it gets into those big questions that I love about who are we as a species, you know, and uh, how how do, uh, you know, Ty Frank and uh, Daniel Abraham view us? And it, I feel like they kind of fit into my particular brand of cynicism and idealism. <laughs> think so. If you uh, read the quote that I put in my newsletter, I think that I think that sums that up. So yeah, I think that's, I guess, where I'll leave it. I'll leave the expanse, except not really, because I can read some uh, complimentary novellas that they wrote al alongside the, the main series. I still have those left, but then unless there's, you know, a new adaptation, the expanse is over. <laughs> and uh, I guess we'll see what they get up to next. <laughs> Next is a book I uh, am just, I guess, 100 or 150 pages into. Still have a lot ahead of me with this one. This is The Hilltop by Asaf Gavron. And this was translated from the Hebrew by Stephen Cohen. Uh, it came out a couple of years ago. Uh, and I am reading it for my uh, Synagogue's Israel book club, uh, which is meeting on Tuesday. So I'm hoping uh, I'm finished or very near finished by Tuesday with this book and luckily we'll be on Zoom. So even if I'm not feeling 100%, I could probably still participate. Uh, so yeah, uh, I was a little nervous about this book uh, because it takes place uh, in a settlement in the West Bank and uh, you know, trying to understand uh, those uh, characters as people, but it's, you know, the most fraught part of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is of uh, what is happening in the settlements. And these people are definitely, I mean, or I should say that Gavron is not, you know, an apologist. He's not a settler. Uh, he also doesn't paint them as demons. Uh, so I think, well, mostly what he seems to be doing is really uh, satirizing the shit out of what's happening, especially with Israeli uh, bureaucracy in this sort of uh, wild, wild west uh, sort of uh, area uh, where uh, we're following characters on uh, this settlement uh, that uh, has grown to be illegal, uh, but uh, there's like this whole thing about uh, people bringing illegal like uh, encampments onto the settlement uh, that uh, the government says you can't have there, but then there's all this paperwork to get through about removing them, so that's not re it's not removed. And there's definitely a disconnect between uh, sort of uh, the civilian government and the army that's out there, which sees its mission really as protecting uh, Israeli citizens, even when they aren't, you know, legally supposed to, to be there. Uh, and there's also such uh, satirism as uh, looking into the uh, protests that happen, like one of the protests that happens here 
is about, uh, you know, a divider fence that uh, the army wants to put up. And uh, both the settlers and uh, the uh, Palestinians in a nearby village and also the left-wing Israelis who come in, they all are against uh, this uh, fence, uh, the left-wing Israelis and uh, the Palestinians because of, you know, cutting off Palestinian freedom and livelihood. And also, it also would cut into some of the settler land, so they're upset about that as well. So there was this whole scene where... Uh, they were, uh, I think a leftist and a settler were yelling, you know, epithets at each other, and then they get into, take down the fence, and they, then the other one's like, yeah, take down the fence! And then people apparently leave their signs there, and uh, the other side uses them to fortify, you know, things in the settlement, or, you know, sometimes, you know, right-wingers protest it, you know, apparently at uh, Arab villages, and they use uh, right-wing signs to fortify, uh, their stuff as well. I mean, that's stuff that Gavron was talking about. I decided to to listen to an interview uh, that I'll link down below. I guess I'm a little early, I feel like, for listening for interviews uh, about this book because I'm not that far into it yet. Uh, but of course, in this interview, they mostly talked about the conflict uh, and uh, not so much about the characters. And in fact, I think most of what they talked about in the, about the characters I'd already read about. I mean, um, this uh, book uh, is much less esoteric than the Colin McCann book at Puragon, which I read uh, last month for the club. Although uh, McCann, you'll see he uh, blurbed it on the back. We have some really big names here. We have like Israeli uh, writers, like, you know, we have Amos Oz and Edgar Carrot, uh, but uh, then we have Khaled Husseini and Reza Aslan too. So, I mean, and he won a, uh, a prize for this as well. Uh, and I think it's his first book uh, published uh, in uh, English. Uh, and I feel like I've rambled off of a point here, but uh, yes, the uh, main characters of the book are these two brothers. And I think they're supposed to sort of um, kind of be stand-ins, hopefully have more characterization than that, uh, of uh, types of Israeli um, manliness. Like one is the stereotypical Israeli machismo sort of man with the older brother Roni, who... Uh, went uh, to uh, the U.S. and apparently, you know, had a big falling out there. It seems like he seemed to be some sort of, uh, I don't think venture capitalist is technically the right word, but he's like an adventurer and maybe his schemes go awry. And then he comes back to Israel and he comes to this settlement where his brother Gabi has remade himself uh, and has turned religious uh, and uh, goes under a different name and he just sort of needs somewhere to crash. And while he's there, He's tried to start up like an artisanal business with a Palestinian in the neighboring village uh, for selling cheap olive oil, which uh, seems like it's already has uh, lots of marketing uh, failure in that. Um, so there's, I guess, just like a lot of absurdity in this. Uh, we have gone into a bit of the backstory of the brothers. It, they both grew up on a kibbutz, which, you know, one thing that uh, Gavron goes into is uh, the similarities between the kibbutz movement and the settlements, which... <laughs> Uh, for me, I feel like, you know, I, I, I love the idea of uh, the kibbutz movement, uh, which isn't quite uh, present anymore. I mean, the socialist uh, gestalt of them is certainly pretty much over. Um, but you can kind of see the similarity of sort of the, you know, the Jewish uh, immigrants, uh, you know, staking a claim for themselves, you know, uh, you know, getting away from the anti-Semitism and oppression of uh, former life and, you know, staking something in a homeland, uh, you know, slightly different ideologies, uh, kind of, but uh, there are some similarities in that. Uh, and uh, it goes, uh, you know, there's uh, the back of the, the, just various parts of uh, the history and conflict are in the background for these characters who are both orphans, their parents were killed uh, in sort of, uh, in, in sort of indirectly uh, based on a Syrian gunfire uh, exchange uh, in the Golden Heights. Uh, his, their parents were killed and they were raised on this kibbutz with, uh, you know, foster parents and uh, then made their own way and did their own stuff and we're getting into that now. And I feel like the narrative is a little clunky, but I feel like there's a lot more meat on the bones as in characterization and interesting, you know, down-to-earth stuff, I feel like, like legitimate stuff to be probing here about their lives and the conflict like that a Paragon didn't have because it was too pie in the sky. And this is much more, you know, grounded uh, and uh, compelling and challenging, I think, on a real level. Uh, although I do wish it were a little uh, less uh, wordy, I suppose. Uh, maybe deal with backstory a little differently, I don't know. But uh, yeah, uh, that's where I am with it. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, my Israel Club uh, meeting, book club meeting won't be canceled this time. I'm sure I will be uh, 
using the thoughts from the group to talk about how I ultimately feel about about this whole book uh, when I uh, talk about it next on this channel next week. <laughs> Oh boy, and I'm really, really near the end here, so I just hope I can get this in, that for the booktube prize, the next book I will be reading is A Word on the Wing by Scott Widensall, which is the nature book. It's about birds. I am very excited to be reading a birding book like all the cool nature kids on booktube, uh, but I can't say more about it than that because I'm a booktube prize judge. I'm mum on the booktube prize until the quarterfinals are over. But I will leave information, including my uh, preliminary thoughts video about my quarterfinals ballot, uh, and also uh, the website, uh, down below. So yeah, that about covers it for me now. I gotta really, really uh, run past uh, the battery here. It's almost about to die. So uh, I am going to wrap this up, hopefully get this video out, and really try to take the rest of this weekend very, very easily. Uh, I was talking uh, about booktube prize reading. I am still kind of behind with that, so hopefully I can uh, get a bunch of that done. I'm not feeling too uh, down in the dumps to not pay attention to reading, so let's, uh, you know, get a move on that self, because uh, we only have uh, less than a month left before the ballot is due. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I hope you are all having good produ pr productive <laughs> weekends as well, and a great start to your May reading. I will be back on this channel in the next couple of days to do a page 112 tag video, which I'm very excited about, although maybe I don't, uh, I shouldn't add another book to my TBR for this month, but I will be doing that anyway, so stay tuned. Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.